The other announcement is that this is a bit different format for our morning service because today we have elected and chosen to have a very special service to ordain our brother Michael Quigley as a deacon in our church. And so that will be the thrust of our service this morning. And I would um, want you to turn with me, if you would, to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses beginning with verse 8. What I purpose to do in our message is to set before you the biblical requirements for being a deacon. Second, to set before you the duties of a deacon. And third, set before you the duties of the church towards those who serve as deacons. And as we look at these qualities in the first part of our message, I do want to emphasize that these are qualities that all believers should have and manifest in their life. Uh, there are qualities that we should strive for as individual believers. So keep that in mind. This doesn't apply just to deacons, but of course it does, according to our text, apply to our brother. And as we come before God today, for that purpose of ordaining him. Deacons likewise must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and let those also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Let, let deacons be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their own household. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. The very first quality that is set before us in this passage is that he must be a man of dignity. The King James translates that word grave. Among other things, this means that he must be one who, because of his life, because of the qualities of his life, is worthy of respect and honor. He is to be a noble, dignified, and serious person. His life should be marked by continual growth in grace, a life of consistent godliness. Now perhaps you might ask the question, why is this requirement necessary since deacons are not responsible for the spiritual matters of the church? Well, the answer to that question is simply this. Deacons are office bearers within the local assembly. And in a very real sense, office bearers do reflect the character of the church. The very fact that the church has recognized one as a church officer, elder, deacon, means that the church has, in a sense, put their stamp of approval upon them. We approve of you as a person in our midst. And that saying that we approve of you means that we have confidence in you because we know that not only do we see you here, but you represent our church wherever you go. And you will be a good representative of our church. The second requirement is stated in these words, not double tongue, 
a marginal reading means not given to double talk. He must be a man that is accurate in his speech. What is double talk? Well, I don't know if you're old enough to remember an old expression that was quite current and that I was growing up in, the, in that day. And you might talk of, uh, describe someone that was a bit deceitful in their dealings as he talks out of both sides of his mouth. That was a way of saying he wasn't being honest. Double talk. Double talk re usually refers to evasive or ambiguous language. But it could go deeper than that. It could also refer to someone who betrays your confidence. Now in the course of a deacon's duty in, in helping others, it very well could be that our deacons will come to understand and know some details about an individual or even about a family. And those details should be kept in strict confidence. It also means that he must be trustworthy if he's to be effective in carrying out his duty. Then thirdly, we find that he is not to be addicted to much wine. Well, this means he's a man who controls his appetites. He must be temperate in all things and manifest that in his life. Those who are well disciplined in every area of their life earn and win the respect of others. You see, confidence is earned a nickel and a dime at a time. But it can be destroyed that quick. And so there must be great care in temperance in your life. Those who are not well disciplined, those who do not live an orderly life, will not be sensitive to those things that need attention in the church. They will not focus on areas where we need to improve here or there or in some other area. Why? Because if he's disorderly in his own life, he doesn't recognize anything as being out of order. So it's good, good quality. The fourth statement is, not fond of sordid gain. His heart is not set on the accumulation of material things. He is a man who knows that life consists not in the abundance of the things that we possess. Surely we have the warning that Paul gave to Timothy, but those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many a pain. You see, the opposite quality of what we're talking, describing here is that you know how to handle your money. But not only do you know how to handle it, there are going to be times when you may, out of the generosity of your own heart, be willing to help others. And that's a good quality for all of us to have. The fifth quality is this, holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. First of all, this means that he must have a firm grip on sound doctrine. And why is it necessary for a deacon to be so well taught in doctrine since he is not the teaching, preaching elder in the church? Well, here's the reason. And it's a good one. 
because as he has opportunity to minister to the physical and material needs of others, often he may have the opportunity of presenting the message of God's grace. He may be called upon to give a word of counsel and that counsel should be based clearly, solidly upon the word of God. But not only is he to have a firm grip on sound doctrine, he must have a clear conscience. The Apostle Paul purposed to have a clear conscience. Here are his words. Always maintain a blameless conscience, both before God and man. The end and the design and the purpose of sound doctrine is that of a godly life. And then the very next verse says, those who aspire to the office of deacon must first be tested and proven. But in this matter of a clear conscience, how would it be possible to tell if a man has a clear conscience? Well, in an absolute sense, that's impossible. But in a relative sense, it is possible. And here's the reason. Christ said, by their fruits, you shall know them. He didn't say God shall know them. He said you shall know them. And as we mentioned earlier, a man's doctrine is to affect the way he lives. And if a man possesses sound doctrine, and yet he can offend one of his brethren and never have a sensitive conscience to go and ask that brother to forgive him, something's wrong. And a man who would occupy the place of leadership must be a man who knows what it is to have the implications of the truth worked out in his everyday life, day by day. Then in the sixth place, he must be the husband of one wife and be a good manager of his children and household. This means he is to be above reproach in his marriage. We do not take the position that it's an absolute necessity that he be married. But if he is married, one wife, and a good manager of his household. In fact, that description of marriage really goes a bit deeper. It literally means he is to be a one woman man. To put it in a different way, he is to have eyes only for his wife. And of course, that would be true if God is pleased to bless our brother with a wife. He is to rule his household. Paul does not add, for how can Paul, uh, we have the words, how can he rule the house of God? And uh, another portion, if he cannot rule his own household. Finally, in verse 10, we have an overall requirement. And let those who also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons if they be found without reproach. They are not to serve until they have been proven and tested. How long have you been with us, Michael? Started visiting a long time ago, but it was, I remember like maybe five or six. Several years. Several years. And I think all of us would not hesitate to testify that our brother has been a good example before the church during those years. And it has manifested the qualities that we are speaking about now. So in our mind and heart, yes, Michael has been proven. <coughs> and tested. Now I want to address the congregation. 
I've been talking primarily to, to Michael and his requirements. That's the requirements to be a deacon. Now, what are you supposed to do as a deacon? Our Constitution says deacons are responsible to administer the ordinary business, secular affairs, and benevolence concerns of the church so that the elders may devote themselves without destruction to the more spiritual matters of the church. They must fulfill the duties of their office in cooperation with and subjection to the elder. The average church member probably does not know and is not aware of how much is required even of a small church in terms of business, in terms of bookkeeping, in terms of helping others with benevolence, making sure the building is comfortable, that the doors are open on time and locked after everybody goes on and on. There are a lot of things that have to be taken care of to assure the smooth running of the church. So that's your job. And it's good you have a good helper, Jonathan the two of you working together. Now to the congregation, you have some responsibilities. And there are six that I want to set before you as a church. The first one is the duty of mutual submission. That duty is stated in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21, and be subject to one another in the fear of of Christ. I call to your attention the words in the fear of Christ. This is to characterize the entirety of our Christian life. It is to be the great motivating factor in each of our Christian duties. This duty of mutual submission is stated in other portions of the scripture. 1 Peter 5, 5. You younger men likewise be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Paul, writing to the Romans, says, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Paul, writing to the Philippians, said to that church, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. The principle that is taught by all of these passages is simply this. Men are not isolated individuals. Men are, in, they are dependent to some degree, upon one another. Paul tells the Romans, we are members one of another. Paul tells the Romans, for no man lives to himself, and no man dies to himself. That is a relationship that we have. Charles Hodge, a commentator, says the essential equality of men and their mutual dependence lay the foundation for the obligation of mutual subjection. Those who serve as deacons, I'm speaking to the church, are our fellow believers. And because of that, we should practice as believers mutual submission one to another. Second, every effort must be made by the church to have and maintain a spirit of unity within the church. That is a good sign of a healthy church. Paul writing to the believers at Ephesus said, therefore, 
I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you are called, with all, listen to these qualities, humility, gentleness, patience, showing forbearance to one another in love. Be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That is the duty of each one of us as a part of this church. Blessed, our Lord said, blessed are the peacemakers. Third duty that the congregation has is the duty to faithfully hold up in prayer those who occupy a position in the church. We have prayed for the Lord to provide church officers. God has done that. Now our duty is to pray for our church officers. <coughs> I, preach, I personally appreciate the many times that I hear my name mentioned in prayer as you pray for your pastor, for Pastor Mattis, for Jonathan, and now for Michael. Pray that God would give grace, wisdom, discernment to fulfill the responsibilities. Pray that they may abound in the fruit of the Spirit, love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Pray that there will always be that good, solid working relationship among the officers and among our congregation. The fourth duty for the church is this. To assist the deacons in carrying out their duties, there is work to be done. There should always be plenty of volunteers to help out. Let them know of your desire to be a help. Let them know that you're praying for them. Be very alert and aware of things you can do to help them carry out their duties. The fifth duty of the congregation is this. Show your love and appreciation to them as they serve you. One way, as I've already mentioned, that is to be willing to help them with their work, but beyond helping them with their duties, show your love and interest by manifesting a sincere interest in them and in their families. And finally, I challenge you as a congregation Maintain a spirit of thankfulness to them and to God for them. Go out of your way to express your appreciation for the things that they do and the way they serve us. And even if they're not receiving a salary, it's always good and right to express your appreciation for what others do. <clears throat> we have considered the biblical requirements for being a deacon. We have looked at the duties of those who serve in that capacity. We have been reminded of, their, of our duties as a church to those who serve in the place of leadership. May God be pleased to bless our church with a unique sense of his presence as we seek to exercise great care in following the biblical precepts and choosing those who serve in a place of leadership. And as a church, we must never, never take lightly the matter of leadership. We must make sure that we make use of all the means God has given us 
to make certain that we recognize and appoint only those whom God has raised up among us. And it is our responsibility as a church to be sensitive to and aware of those whom God may be raising up in our midst to serve in a place of leadership. It's a very happy occasion and we're glad that you could be here with us to be a part of it. And what we're going to do now is ask that Pastor Mathis, who you as visitors would not necessarily know that, Pastor Mathis has been in another part of the building translating the service into Spanish. And some of our brethren are listening to that service with the earphones this morning. But I'm going to have him come as well as our other deacon, Jonathan. And when Pastor Mathis uh, arrives here, then we're going to ask our brother uh, Michael to come and kneel here. And the three of us then will lay hands on Michael and pray for him as he takes on that responsibility. We'll wait just a moment for Pastor Mathis.